if that's okay. And um, uh, we will we'll go and uh, route this uh, camera towards the screen rather than towards uh, me. Um, and uh, start recording that. Okay, so um, it's my tremendous uh, pleasure to be able to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Kurt Kruger, um, who joins us uh, from, um, from Texas, uh, Fort Worth area. Um, uh, it, Kurt is a modeler of great accomplishment and graduated um, from our lab about, what is it, a year and a half ago, Kurt? Yeah. Um, with his PhD. Um, uh, his dissertation uh, examined a number of topics um, uh, related to the intersection of, of modeling and rich empirical data, um, um, including uh, use of machine learning methods together with dynamic models, agent-based models. Um, and uh, one of the most interesting studies included in his thesis concerned um, the work that he's going to be presenting today, which um, really uh, broke new ground as far as applications of dynamic modeling and its combination with um, uh, the uh, very powerful and, and uh, well-established um, literature on um, modeling uh, human behavior using uh, a random utility theory or discrete choice theory. And we're very fortunate to have Kurt here with us to share with you um, some of that work um, and its use together with, uh, with agent-based models. Agent-based models that, uh, like those we've been looking at in this boot camp, were articulated within any logic. Okay. Um, so uh, very fortunate to have Kurt. Kurt is, is active worldwide on modeling projects now, helping to lead them with, um, with teams in Australia in LA and, um, and with other collaborators across the US. Kurt is also notably, and very importantly, the uh, curator and um, plays uh, important uh, sort of editorial role associated with a community gathering site that we will be spending some time um, visiting and um, letting people explore on Friday. The, the health modeling community website sponsored by NIH. We're very fortunate to have Kurt helping to stimulate the growth of that site, um, a site where we'll be contributing quite a lot of materials uh, from this event. And I would welcome Kurt to, uh, to talk about any number of, 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 of these topics um, and those in the audience to ask any, uh, any questions related to any of these items I've mentioned if you're further interested beyond what Kurt covers. So Kurt. Um, uh, take it away. Okay, great. Um, so I guess I don't get to see the audience. I just get to see Nate, but that's fine. I guess once I start sharing No, no, we'll, we'll, we'll turn it turn it round uh, so that you, I won't add insult to injury um, by showing my face. Um, there we go. Um, okay, there we, there we, there we go. Right. Is, that, is that okay? It, it feels a bit more natural now, yeah. Okay, okay. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, so so maybe I'll just sort of get into it, but yeah, I, I guess I wear two hats. That was a great introduction, more than um, I would say by myself for sure, but that's kind of how introduction was supposed to be, I guess. Um, so maybe I'll just kind of jump right into it. The model that we built here was um, looking at tobacco consumption, and there were sort of two primary pieces to the model that were sort of what we were advancing, and one of them was discrete choice experiments using those within the model. And then another one was looking at how we can capture human behavior more broadly. Um, and so I'll touch on a little bit of the second one, but putting a little bit more emphasis on this free choice experiment. Um, and I hope to not last too long so that there can be plenty of time for questions. So let me share my screen. Um, um, okay, it's doing it a little differently. Let me just screen who that one wow all right is my screen being shared on the screen yes, yes it is Kurt. okay great and it's the one where you can see my mouse moving yes okay good i have two screens and it wasn't 100 percent clear which one's being shared. yeah there's okay. there's uncharacteristically two mouse cursors uh one um one static one dynamic 
One's probably your mouse cursor and the other one's mine. It's probably uh, okay. correct. Um, you, you surmise correctly, right. young Padawan. I guess they don't give PhDs for nothing. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so um, the street choice experiments in systems modeling of human health behavior. So I didn't finish this slide, but never mind. We're just going to skip it anyways. Okay, so uh, first I want to spend a little time talking about um, the context in which we're modeling, because that will help us understand why we need to focus on the different techniques that I'll talk about. So this is just sort of a diagram. I hope that you guys have covered a little bit of causal loop diagrams. This is just one I pulled from the internet. It's a really complicated model. It looks at a lot of different features associated with obesity. Um, and so it describes what, what you guys have been learning about called a complex adaptive system. And in complex adaptive systems, again, I think this, is all, this is all should be repeat for you guys. There's a lot of features within complex adaptive systems that make it difficult to use uh, maybe traditional statistical analysis methods alone. And so the idea is that we use other techniques to be able to augment those things. And some of these, some of these features are feedback loops or causal delays, nonlinear interactions, you know, very heterogeneous populations, social network interactions, um, perception of the person, all these sort of things make complex adaptive systems difficult to, to capture alone. So this is the reason why we're using agent-based modeling in conjunction with other methods in the first place, um, or systems modeling more broadly. Um, not only that, though, the situations that we're studying are social systems. So they're complex adaptive systems that I would say, I would argue, have another layer of complexity associated with them because of the social nature. Whenever we're dealing with social systems, systems that are maybe outside of outside of a confined space, even like a hospital, which is complicated, but if we go into the community, if we're looking at people in their normal life, then we're gonna have um, the added complexity of a lot of, a lot of things happening for which we have very little data. So we don't have a lot of data about what people, the kind of decisions that people will make in certain situations that they haven't seen before. And then the data that we do have is often noisy or it's, you know, significantly aggregated, or there's a lot of assumptions with it. And so our ability to draw on data when we're dealing with complex systems in a social setting is, uh, is, is reduced. And so we need to be able to augment that with some other methods. Um, because of this lack of data, this also makes it sometimes difficult, quite difficult, to understand the causal relationships that are present within a system. We don't often know you know, we see a lot of correlations, but especially when we're dealing with human behavior, we don't know if you know my self-perception is going to be causing me to exercise more, or if because I'm exercising more, I'm then changing the way I perceive myself. So there's a, but because of those feedback, it's unclear where the causal relationships are taking place. Um, and then uh, the, the feedback all this happening. Okay, and then the other part is that human behavior is very unpredictable. So that's part of the reason why we're using the screen choice experiments um, to help us add a little bit of predictability to human behavior. And then this last line is sort of a general principle is that policy that we are implementing is often decentralized, there's different agencies that are, that are implementing it, um, and so there's a lot of complexity there as well. Um, okay, so as a result of all this complexity, what people are required to do is essentially um, approximate human behavior. We need to be able to add, to simplify our models because if they're, if they're so complex that we can't understand them, we can't make sure that what's going into the model is accurate. And so as a result, we have to come up with ways of approximating the model. And so one of the ways, one of the things that's often done is that we approximate human behavior using these, this rational, act, rational agent assumption, rational actor assumption, which essentially has these three main assumptions. Some of them can be relaxed a little bit, but these two main assumptions are there. The first one is that we assume people have perfect knowledge. This isn't always the case. We can sometimes reduce that, but we assume that the, the knowledge that agents have is perfect, and then when they do have it, they know it's right. So that's a common assumption that's made. Another common assumption is made is that agents, people, effectively have unlimited computational ability. They, if you give them a complicated question where they have to figure out you know, how far I have to go for something, how much it's going to cost, I'm going to come up with the most optimal solution. And no matter how, no matter how many pieces there are to that question, so I can, I can 
calculate sort of my best option, no matter how many pieces in infinite, in you know, infinitesimal amount of time, immediately without any effort. So that's assumptions often as well. And then the third one um, is that the decision landscape is very simple. A lot of times we're giving agents only one or two or three choices. We're not taking into account a lot of the other things that people really consider. We have limited decision objectives. And the goal here is to work towards a more realistic um, approximation of human behavior. We're never going to leave the world of approximating human behavior, but we want to be able to do it in a way that matches the needs rather than matches the limitations due to mathematical situations. So we want to be able to describe agents that have imperfect knowledge, that don't have all the knowledge, and that the knowledge they have is wrong. Um, and that might be, you know, my perceptions versus the reality. We can capture the perceptions of, re of reality as separate from reality that's useful. We also have agents that have limited computational ability. We don't have the, you know, we, we rely on intuitions a lot. Intuitions are really helpful in order to simplify the, the decision landscape, but they're not, um, they're not as calculated as some of the more um, rational methods that we can leverage. And then the last thing is that the decision landscape is much more complex. My decisions for health, for example, are not just based on some utility function that tells me this is better than this because I'll have to consider, you know, convenience factors. I have to consider social relationships. I have to consider how much, how difficult it is to change a habit. I have to consider the price associated with that change, the uncertainty of the future. There's a lot of characteristics. The decision landscape is much more complex than the agents that are typically put into models. And so our goal here then is to come up with, with a behavior, uh, a, a way of describing humans that's a little bit more realistic. Um, now, in order to do this, I, I think you probably have talked about this somewhat in your model. How do you scope the model? Um, what is the appropriate things to include in your model? Um, so from the perspective of behavior, we want to be able to frame our problem so that we can describe the relevant human behaviors in the appropriate manner, based on what we know and, and what, we're trying to, what we're trying to learn about. So the easiest thing to do when we're dealing with a human behavior is to just ignore it. We exclude it from the model, um, and in fact, whether we know it or not, most of human behavior is excluded from any model that's built. So if I'm building a model on traffic behavior and how people are choosing routes to and from work and which roads they're choosing and are they going to switch between, are they going to buy a different car or something, most of the decisions that a human being is making in their lifetime is not being included in the model. Um, and, and so, so that's the first category. The second thing is we can treat them so-called exogenously. And what this means, the way I mean this here, is that we're describing how the behavior looks from the outside. So we, we look at, this is often statistical distributions or you know, descriptive statistics on data that we have, or perhaps some um, expert opinions on how people make decisions. It could be somewhat qualitative, I suppose. And, and the idea is that this is more accessible because uh, it's, it's somewhat accessible because it relies on data and we can often go out and do a study and find that data, but it generally gener generates static behavior. It's behavior that doesn't change in the light of um, changes to the model. So I interventions that you might want to do or characteristics, the, you know, the model might go into a certain position uh, or you know, generate a certain situation that didn't exist in the real world and so, um, your exogenous behavior is not going to adapt to that. And then the last way that we can capture behavior is endogenously. And this is not just describing how something looks, but it's describing how something emerges. What are the causal principles that are leading to a certain type of behavior? Why, what are the causal or psychological reasons that somebody is choosing to you know, eat unhealthy food in spite of the fact that the doctor told them it's bad for their health, for example? Um, this is the most difficult of the three to obtain um, because it depends on this causal knowledge. And causal knowledge is more than just correlational knowledge, it's more than just knowledge you can get from the data. Um, and, but what this allows us to do is to generate adaptive behavior. That means if we can do an endogenous framing of somebody's behavior in the model, and when we do an intervention condition or we create some counterfactual situation, the agents will adapt as if they were real people. Uh, I mean, sim simulated, sim simplified real people, but they would adapt to it. And because this is the most difficult, the idea is that we would limit 
we would limit the endogenous framings to those things that we care about most, that are most important to our, our question. So it's very, it's very common for, as, as, as a model is developing, to take an item that you thought would be endogenous and actually realize you can do it in an exogenous way, or maybe you don't even need to capture it all, or maybe something that you thought you could capture exogenously, you actually need to come up with a descriptive, a, a causal way to do it. Um, I guess the screen froze. Okay, I saw people's confused looks. Um, okay, so that's the goal: is, is we want to make sure that we're we're you know putting the, the type of decision in the right category. Is it ignored, exogenous, or endogenous? Um, okay, so the public health problem. I'll just do a brief introduction to the model um, so we can get into it and we can see what what it's doing with behavior. It's the public health problem we're looking at is tobacco use. It's the, one of the leading causes of preventable mortality in the US and in Canada. Uh, various interventions have been tried and studied by different researchers and different public health agencies, excise taxes or age restrictions or social media campaigns or other things. Um, and the, the, the focus of this model was looking at an excise tax. So we were looking at, we're building, we're looking at building a model that can sort of predict what types of decisions people are going to make in the presence of an excise tax of a certain amount. And the behavior that we wanted to capture, um, sort of the unique behavior we wanted to capture, was so-called price minimizing behavior. So um, if, you, if you have somebody who's smoking, let's say they're smoking a brand of cigarettes at $5 a pack, and you put on, let's say, a 50 cents uh, tax on top of that pack of cigarettes, um, then then the, you know, the, the tobacco companies might, for example, provide coupons and allow that person to then every fourth pack they can get a deal, for example, and that has a psychological effect so people might sort of maintain their, their consumption. They might change the format. They might go from cartons, from packs to cartons if there's like a carton discount. They might buy cartons of cigarettes. Um, and then if we're dealing with an endogenous behavior, having a carton of cigarette now when you used to buy a pack will change how often you go to the store. It also changes how many cigarettes you have on you at a time. So you might actually, if you start if you start buying cartons, your addiction might grow, right? And you might find that you're smoking more than you used to when the tax happened. The same types of things can occur with pricing changes. If you change your tier from a high quality to a medium quality pack, or you know, social social networks, people can be sharing or buying single six single cigarettes at a time or what have you. So there's different types of complex behaviors that human, humans can engage in to reduce the effectiveness or reduce their kind of exposed price, um, to reduce the effectiveness of this of this uh, of this situation. So the model itself, TPMS, is just tobacco price minimizing strategy model. Yet we, we modeled it after the metro the Minneapolis metro area in the U.S. I'll show you a picture of it in a moment. We have a, a dense urban core, we have a suburban ring, and then there's a rural perimeter on the outside. And then we have two main types of agents. We have the people, the person agent people. They have a daily work or school schedule, so they're at home and they're at work back and forth between these two locations. They have friends, their social networks um, that are connected to them. Um, and then they have demographic information, so socioeconomic status, gender, education type. And then we also have tobacco retailers, so tobacco retailers have various different products that they can offer for each of those products. There's a price associated with it. Um, they could have sales, and there could be a tax that's, that's coming. Um, normally when there's a tax that's coming, we might hear about it ahead of time, so there could be a tax like on the horizon and then the tax sale. So this is sort of a picture of the model. You can see that we've got, you know, this big circle here is the rural area, and then we've got this uh, donut inside here is the suburban area, and we have a dense urban core. And you can see that the population, so the green buildings are the tobacco retailers, these white and blue buildings are houses, and then where everybody, most of the people now are in the yellow buildings, which are the work or the school centers. And so, um, these people uh, um, move back and forth between the yellow buildings and the white buildings, and then the green buildings that are around them are the prices, that are the, that's, those, those are the options they have for purchasing to that. Um, and so you can see that the density of houses and stores is different you know, in different areas, which will change the distance to the store, 
and a number of characteristics. And so we have these three city zones, rural, suburban, urban. And then each of the uh, each person also has one of three education levels, so high school or less, technical school or some college, and then bachelor's or more. And we're dealing with a closed population, so no birth and no death, for people that are uh, 18 to 30. This is our study population. Uh, and we modeled it after the Minneapolis population. And again, tobacco retailers is in the school for mom. So the one thing that this slide, this slide here doesn't talk about is the behavior in relation to tobacco. And so these are the key behaviors that we're adding on top of what I just described. So there's smoking and purchasing. And the idea is that, in, in line with what I was talking about before regarding model scope, is we want to figure out how we're going to describe the behavior that we think is important for smoking. Because our ultimate goal is to look at how much people are consuming uh, you know, in the presence of, of a time. Are they reducing their consumption? Are they increasing their consumption? What types of cigarettes are they buying? And that's not. So, on the one hand, we want to capture smoking. We know from literature that smoking is driven by many non-rational, non um, uh, by addiction, which is a, a non-rational process. There's a lot of non-rational uh, elements there. And so what we decided to do was to, to build an endogenous framework for this. And so we created some models that are endogenous. They sort of are adaptive. Um, but because they're endogenous, they're we had to build many of them on the kind of you know, the very research based. There's you know a lot of a lot of estimates and, and um, assumptions going into those. And because we had this endogenous addiction component, we needed we wanted to be able to rely a little bit more. Um, we wanted to have a little bit better description or a little bit more sort of validatable of a description for purchasing. And so what we did was I'm calling this free choice experiment an exogenous one because it generates a statistical model of how people make decisions, and I'll get to that. And the, the reason here is that purchasing, we can argue, is boundedly rational, and there's a lot of studies. Now, it's not really, but, but um, to a much better accuracy, we can assume that purchasing is you know, more rational than addiction is going to be rational. So we use a technique that has been used in a lot of econometric studies, looking at how people make purchases, um, you know, price sensitivities and whatnot. And so this is where we're using the discrete choice experiment to describe the purchasing behavior. So what is a discrete choice experiment? Well, discrete choice theory um, can be thought of as a, a, as a way of, of determining, of elucidating people's preferences. What are people's preferences? What do they prefer for purchases? And so there's sort of two broad categories of, of methods that we can use to uncover people's preferences. One of them is stated preference, and the other one is revealed preference. Re revealed preference is basically gathering purchase data, looking at people's actual decisions to figure out how they're making decisions. The advantage of revealed preference data is that it's records, you know, it, it comprises records of actual decisions, so there's no estimates of what people might decide. It's, these are decisions that people have actually made. The downside to revealed preferences, and the reason why we're using stated preferences, or the reason why stated preferences exist, is that revealed preference data doesn't give you any information about people about what people would decide in a counterfactual situation. By definition, it depends on data. And so if you don't have data for something because that tax has never existed, or because you're proposing something that hasn't happened before, we can't get the preference for it. So in that situation, we're, we rely on techniques within that idea, within the stated preference domain. And the discrete choice experiment is within the stated preference domain. The advantage there is you can now ask questions, you can begin to ask some counterfactual questions. The discrete choice experiment relies for its prediction on random utility theory, which is just you have this utility U, and that utility, the more utility there is, the more attractive the decision is. And it's composed of two independent pieces. One of the pieces are observed factors, so your x is the observed factor, and then that epsilon term is the unobserved factors, the, the noise factors, this is where the random of random utility comes from. And this assumption is, is effectively where, where the, the, the rational actor assumption comes into this model, or to the beginning. Uh, and then making some certain assumptions with the standard logic model, which is a, a number of different discrete choices uh, theory um, uh, models you can use, but the, the logic model is the one that we use you can boil down this, this um, utility function into a probability function. So 
you have a probability of making, let's say, of making choice one, given that you have n choices, the probability is going to be a certain number that depends on the availability of other choices. So this exp function, I didn't want to put too much math here, but all that's saying is that your probability of making choice one depends on the other available choices as well. That's why you have the, the, the sum of other exponents at the bottom. So what this results in is a, prob a, a, a probability for any, if I give you a choice and there's six options there, it's going to give you a probability for each of those options and that probability sums to one. So the utility in our formulation is composed of two pieces. There's a piece associated with the individual. There's a piece associated with the individual preference. And so this is, is, is four terms that, that, that are the one, one associated with their education type, so there's one of three education types. One associated with their income level, there's a, a number of income levels. One associated with one of two genders, and then one associated with their inventory size. This is the number of cigarettes they have in them. So the model is determining over time how many cigarettes they have because they're consuming cigarettes, and every time they consume a cigarette, the inventory increases, and every time they purchase, it goes up. So the inventory size we thought would be an important piece for how people are going to make a choice. And then, then there's another, uh, another utility associated with each of the choices. So this individual preference is, is the case for that person for every single one of the choices they make. It's, it's unchanged, any, any one of the options. And then there's a, a component of the utility that depends on the number of characteristics of the choice. So what is the price of this option? What is the, is there a discount on this option? Is there a distance to the store for this option? What's the projected tax amount? Is there a projected tax time? Is it coming in three months or is it coming in one month? And then there's an interaction term between the tax and the amount, the, the tax amount and the tax time. Um, and then finally, when you're when you're describing this free choice experiment, you have to define what's called the decision context. So this decision context you'll see in the next slide. There's two decision contexts. There's an at home and an in store. So I'll talk about this more in the next slide. So um, now, because this is a stated preference data, uh, because this is a stated preference study, and because it's exogenous, we had to gather data about how real people are, uh, are would, 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 how real people are telling us they would make a decision, right? So we had to do a survey. Uh, so that means we put together a survey. We hired some discrete choice experiment experts. Um, and we did a study online, we gathered 1,800 responses. We used 1,500 of them to fit the model. So this is a statistical model. There's a number of parameters that need to be fit according to that data. So we had 1,500 people respond. Each responded to 12 questions. And then we used that number to cross-validate against 300 people who weren't, whose responses weren't used to train the model, to, to, to fit the model. And so that allowed us to do some cross-validation. We predicted each of those 300 responses. We compared them to the actual responses. And we saw how well it fit, and it fit pretty well. This was done online. We did this online with the US population age 18 to 30. And we had approximate equal dis distributions across all education levels. And we can also consider their resident location. They would tell us rural or whatever. So each of those three characteristics we could determine from the model. And this is the, this is the, the study, the, the question that they saw. So at the top, they see uh, the decision context. So it says, you are at home and have decided to buy cigarettes. And then these are the store options. And it says, how many cigarettes you have left? And then it says, what's the tax situation? So in this situation, there's a dollar tax expected on cartons in three months' time. So you don't need to worry yet, but in three months, you'll have it. And there's no tax predicted there's not going to be any tax in the near future for PACs. And then we have this grounding question where we, we had earlier in the, in the survey asked, what was the brand of the last cigarette you purchased? And then in our database, we looked up and said, what tier, what pricing tier is that brand? We said, okay, you're a medium tier purchaser. And then here's the available choices. So you have, in this case, you have three stores, but three is the maximum. There might only be one or two stores available. And so, in store one, you can see there's a certain distance away. Um, this is a bit of an older slide, but we would say um, one of three distance categories, how far away the store is from me. And then we would say, well, for each packs and cartons and low, medium, high tier cigarettes, what's available at this store? So you can see that this store is currently having a sale on low, uh, low tier 
packs and, and medium tier packs, and they don't offer any of the other packs down here, and they have the low tier cartons as well. And then there's other tobacco products, so we also included sort of uh, terms for e-cigarettes, chew, and, and rolling rolling tobacco. And so for each one, so then basically the person would want to select on one of these buttons, which would be their choice in this case, and they could also choose no purchase over here. There always needs to be this no purchase option. And so this was a study we did this with 1,800 people. Each person answered 12 studies, and we had all of the results from the study, and then we could fit the, the, the DC model. So that was the DCE piece. That this was separate from the discrete choice experiment. If all we were interested was in people's purchasing, we can write this up, we can publish on it, we're done. But we, what we needed to then do is take this and put it within this dynamic systems model, the agent-based model. Um, and there's some interesting conclusions about uh, interesting pieces of learning that we, we came up with. So this, these are the state charts. I assume that you all have seen state charts at this stage in the, the boot camp. So, um, we have a number of different state charts here. Remember before we talked about before we talked about these two types of behavior, right? Smoking and purchasing. And so that's what's happening here. We have smoking and purchasing. We have smoking on the left. But basically everyone in the model is essentially one of three states. You're either a never smoker, a current smoker, or a former smoker. If you're a current smoker, you can be actively smoking, or you can be not actively smoking, and then there's this. There's this little uh, state here where we might need to talk about it now, I'll come back to it in a moment, but it's just sort of a little catch state, that state. But basically, you're either not smoking or smoking. Um, and then you have these four transitions. You have initiation, you have this consumption transition as having a cigarette transition, um, and then you have a quitting transition and a relapse transition. So this is basically how we're capturing people smoking. Um, and I'll, I'll have a slide or two about, um, about that in a moment. But the focus of this one here is in the purchasing one. So basically purchasing, we have, remember before we were talking about two types of decisions. We have home from, from home decisions and from store decisions. Um, so I just want to go back to here. Uh, the difference between the home and the store decision is that this is a typical example of an at-home decision, but the at-store at decision, the in-store decision, there's only one store. It's the store that you're at, and there is no distance row because you're at that store and there's no distance. And the idea is that your from home decisions describe planned choices, and your from store decisions describe impulse choices. You're in the store for some reason other than to buy cigarettes, do you buy cigarettes while you're there? And so there's a state chart here, and then there's another state chart here. Each of those state charts basically determined when one of those decision contexts was going to occur. Remember, important for this free choice experiment is that you set up the question to have a decision context. But the, the, there's nothing in the discrete choice experiment that says how often or under what conditions does this decision context occur. And so then when we're introducing the discrete choice experiment in our model, we have to consider when are we going to create this context? When are we going to give the person the choice? So what we did was basically said, you know, if you're in the state waiting for at home, you're waiting for an at home decision context. About once a week, we said, oh, about once a week, people are going to consider their cigarette stuff. Do they need to make another purchase? So we create a, a from home, an at home decision context option once every week. And then the in store option, we basically say, well, people are going to be going to stores for other reasons, for groceries, to fill up gas. So maybe three times a week, on average, people are going to be in a store that sells cigarettes for some other reason. So now they're faced with this with this decision, this impulse decision, that they buy or not. <clears throat> so that's that's how we get here. And then this state chart down here just keeps track of what location they're in. If they're at home, if they're at school or at work, is the same one, um, or if they're at the store. Um, um, oh, yeah, OK. Uh, I just wanted to mention this. So, so so basically, the, the screen choice experiment has this random utility, or this utility that's determined, or this utility that's determined for each choice, right? Depending on the price, education, income, and so on. So basically, what we needed to do was reproduce that environment for each agent in the model. And then the idea, by using the discrete choice model within the ABM, is that the agents would be making decisions as if they were part of the respondent pool for this survey. 
right? So hopefully the agents are going to be making decisions in a way that's statistically similar to the way that people are reporting their decisions in the survey. That's, that's the basic idea for using the discrete choice experiment, is that our agents are making decisions, there. we're describing their behavior, we're not talking about the logic about how that's arising, we're just saying, what's the probability based on this sample population? So our agents then should be making decisions as if they were part of the 1,800 people that we surveyed, which is more realistic than, than you know, if I just came up with a thought. Um, so this is titled incorrectly, this should say agent behavior. Um, oh, consumption, no, that's right. Okay, so the smoking behavior, the consumption behavior, I was just gonna talk for two slides about that so you have a bit of context. And so this this was basically where, remember this is an endogenous model, so we're not, we're not describing we're not describing how things look. We're trying to describe how things work. We're trying to describe the causal relationships. I think it went down again. Yep. Um, and so you can see here. Thank you so much. You can see here on the left, um, we have a social network, right? And so the idea is that we have a model. Like, again, I showed you the I showed you before. We have let's go back a little bit. We, all these lines are social network connections. So the idea is that we have this. Social network, agents existing within a social network, and each agent has these states, each agent has you know, variables and parameters and other things associated with them. But then within each agent, there's this thing called an addiction module. Um, and that, that addiction module can be system dynamics, it could be agent-based, it could be statistics, it could be whatever we want. But the idea is that we're gonna build a number of different uh, behavioral frameworks describe addiction or consumption over time, and then we're gonna be able to swap them out. So, other than building a whole new model, I just changed this piece. So I have one of these modules, like I have four different modules, and three of them are turned off at any given time, and one's turned on, and then I run the model again, and I just switch one's turned on. So, in the end, we had four different addiction modules. Um, and, oh, the goal of each of these addiction modules because they all work very differently, but their goal is the same. Their goal is to give us at any given time what I want. I want to know what is my probability to initiate this year? What's my initiation hazard? What is my consumption hazard? Well, how many cigarettes am I, am I going to be having in the next hour or the next day or whatever? What's my probability per time of quitting or of relapsing? So at any moment in time, I ask this module, I say, you know, if I'm current smoker, I ask this module, what's my probability of quitting and what's my number of cigarettes per day I'm smoking? And this module, any time it's asked, will take characteristics of that person and return numbers. So that's how all modules can kind of be. They're all, I don't know, I, the agent doesn't need to know how they work, it just needs to know, every time I ask, you're gonna give me four numbers, that's all it needs to know. So these are the four models we used. I won't go into too much detail. I have some slides if you have some questions about them. But the basic idea for the first one, this inventory during module, is just that if people have few cigarettes, they're gonna reduce their consumption from their normal rate. And if people have many cigarettes, they're gonna increase their consumption a little bit from their normal rate. That's the idea, very simple. Then the PCT, the perceptual control theory, this is just a module, it's kind of complex, but basically what it does is it, is it focuses on people's perception of their smoking, rather than on their smoking themselves. So, for example, if I smoke 10 cigarettes a day and all my friends smoke five cigarettes a day, I might consider myself relatively um, a heavy smoker. Whereas the same person who's smoking 10, if their friends all smoke 15 cigarettes a day, I might consider myself a moderate or a light smoker. And so that social exposure is, is sort of where the perception comes in. And then the flex P, the flexible set point PCT, flex P. This one was an adaptation of PCT where people can change what they want to be perceived as. So I want to be perceived as, I like perceiving myself as a heavy smoker, I'm fine with it, then that's okay. But if I want to be perceived as a moderate smoker and then my friends are smoking, they're quitting, then I'm gonna to wanna to quit with them, for example. And then the last one is a, is a, is a module that, is a, again, it's a control theory module, it's named after the first author of a paper, um, or I named it after him. And it, it sort of looks at these opponent processes, it's kind of complicated, um, but the idea is that it's been externally validated using mice and cocaine use, and then they modified it for tobacco use, and so then we thought, since this was an externally 
you know, experimentally validated one, we would put it in, in our paper and see, see how, it, how it performed. Okay, so, so now we have so now we have agents and they have they have social behavior and they have personal behavior and they go to work and they go home and they have social social network and and, and so then is a, now we have to validate the model. There's a lot of pieces to this model. How do we validate? Well, the first thing we did is we validated the DCE by itself without the agent based model. Now I talked about that already using the 1500 responses to predict the remaining 300 that cross validation process. Now, what's significant about the DCE is that there's many, many parameters for this model. It's 160 parameters. There's parameters for each of the choices, for each of the educational categories, for each of the uh, uh, sort of options that are available to them. So there's a lot of parameters in, in, the, in the model. And many of them were not significant. But when we're putting the DCE within the ABM, you can't avoid, you can't take those not significant parameters out of the model. They have to be there somehow. Um, and so what we did is we bootstrapped a thousand sets of parameter values. So now we basically have a thousand, a thousand rows of 160 parameters each. And then when we're running the model, we say, which row am I going to use? Which sets of parameters am I going to use in my model? Um, and, and one thing that we found um, that I'll get, well, I'll get from the next point. Um, okay, so then the purchasing behavior, so then what we do is we put the DCE in the ABM. Uh, we put the DCE in the ABM, and, and we just put in a placeholder addiction behavior. So there wasn't any sort of interesting dynamic addiction. We just had a fixed static, I'm going to have five cigarettes a day, whatever the mean of the population was. And everyone was a smoker, so it was a very stylized population. And we looked for situations where the street choice experiment module was making the agents perform really um, unrealistic behavior. So the first thing we looked at was the pack carbon purchase ratio. And we found that the agents were consistently buying packs and cartons at about the rate that the discrete choice experiment survey told us they should. So that was good. Um, but what we noticed was, so the number of other things that were good, but one of the bad things was we noticed that the average inventory was way off. People were, were storing up, agents in the model were storing up a thousand or more cigarettes. When we looked into why, it's obviously unrealistic. When we looked into why, we realized that because of some of these not significant, these statistically insignificant parameters, some of the people were basically, the more cigarettes they had, the more cigarettes they wanted. So that term turned out to be not significant, but maybe it should be negative, right? The more you have, the less you want to buy, so there should be a negative uh, correlation between them. Because it was insignificant, it was a positive correlation, and so people were buying like crazy. So then we had to add extra logic, control logic within the model to stop people from being able to buy so often and so much. We're buying cartons and stuff left, right, and So we restricted, we started, we added a restriction which said that you can't buy, you, you will not be presented with a decision, a decision option if you already have, I don't know, two days or something with cigarettes. If you already have a certain stock of cigarettes, you can't purchase. So we limited that from happening. Um, and then the last thing is we, we, we built our, our final addiction model. We, when we had sort of the full model, we qualitatively looked at the behavior of many agents, looked at they were consuming at stable, consuming at stable rates. We were looking at um, how can we get sort of average consumption rates that were, were appropriate. Um, and then uh, and through, this, through this process of validation, we ended up paring down our initials. We, we ended up throwing away eight different modules that uh, weren't performing. So there were four left from 12 that we ended up developing over the course of the um, okay, so lastly, I'll speed up. I think I think I'm probably running out of time, but um, so lastly, talk about or getting to the end. Of calibration sensitivity. There's a lot of runs. This is a pretty heavy computational model. Um, the idea was though that we wanted to reproduce something that happened historically. So in 2009 in Minneapolis, St. Paul, there was a tax that was put on cigarette, and there's a survey that was done in 2006 and one in 2010, looking at people's smoking rate. Um, reported smoking rate on the survey for each of the nine subpopulations. So rural, um, you know, three different um, uh, three different city regions and three different education types. And so then our goal was to reproduce this. So we looked at 2006. We, we created we created our population based on the demographics we had for 2006 and the smoking rate and so on. We initialized it there, and then we ran the model up until 2010. 
and we looked at how well it predicted the 2010 data from the historical data, um, given that there was an excise tax that took place in 2009. So there was a, a tax that came on, and we looked at how our model was able to predict that. Um, this resulted in basically, you know, we had four different prediction modules, and for each of those, we had nine different subpopulations because we only ran, um, for computational reasons, we only ran each each model only had one of the subpopulations at a time, one of the nine subpopulations at a time. And then we had 10 replications and then we had a thousand iterations. And it gave us about 30 compute days worth of time. So I ran it on the computers that you guys are sitting at right now um, over about a week and we got, we got what we needed. And um, and then we did some sensitivity with the with the discrete choice experiment. Because so remember, this is this is important for the DCE. Many of the parameters were not significant, and so across this thousand set of parameters, some of those guys are going to be going positive and negative and stuff. So then, what we did was we basically sampled fifty of those randomly, and for for certain specific situations, and we ran those, and then we looked at how much the outputs varied based on the based on based on those uh, sensitivities. Um, and these are the results. This is looking at the objective function. The higher the bar, the worse it was performing. The lower the bar, the better. Um, so the results, the, I'll, I'll be quick here so we have time for questions, but basically we found four different modules. Not There wasn't a module that was clearly the best one for all populations. Um, most of the populations, as you can see here, seven of them had, had, had more than one module that fit pretty well. Um, some of them fit poorly for all modules, but this population here is a notable example of that. Um, and this sort of suggests that that there's that different subpopulations are being driven by different dominant behavioral mechanisms. So the way that people are making decisions in different subpopulations might be different, or there's factors that are outside of the scope of what we've done that are capturing that. Um, when we looked at the historical data, we, know, we noticed that some populations increased their consumption after the tax. Some decreased and some remained pretty stable. Um, and that's just because it's a, a, you know, an older population, I guess, and they have other characteristics taking place, so it's not just the price. Um, and so when we look at when we look at the error bars, these error bars are, are the, basically that's the sensitivity associated with the discrete choice bootstrapping. The um, only two of the nine subpopulations included the historical value within those error bars or within those, those that, that range. But eight of the nine predicted the correct direction of change. So there was there were some good outcomes from it. And then and then here's a, a comparison of each of the different behavioral modules. Um, the simplest one was this IDM, and it actually was the second best performing overall, which is uh, this this bar here. It was the second best performing. Um, the the flex P is very very different. It is just a little bit different from the PCT. But it's the best, and PCT is the worst. So as we were building the model, we, we found one little piece that made this the best performing overall. And then finally, the BCT, you can see this blue bar is very low. This blue bar is how well it fit the consumption data. So not how many people were smokers or former smokers, but how many cigarettes per day was, a, was the current smoker smoking. It fit that really well, because that's where it was calibrated. But it, it didn't have a mod, it didn't have a way of describing how people were quitting or relapsing a cigarette. So it didn't perform well there. Um, and 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 that's it. That's that's kind of all I had for, for now. So if there's any questions I'd be happy to, to take them. So questions for Kurt. Is it possible to run it? Yeah, just to see it. To see it? Yeah. So you could ask Kurt. Kurt, did you uh, pick that up? Uh, my, geez, I, I have the file here. I can try running it. Let me. Why don't I try running it as someone else thinks of a question? Great. Um, additional question. I have one. Um, so you had talked about the difference endogenous and exogenous, so for the yeah. smoking behavior versus consumption behavior. Um, if you had taken surveys on the smoking behavior, would you still consider that endogenous, or would you, how would you describe that, or why why would you not do that or do that? 
If I had taken surveys on neopita on, on the, the smoking behavior day. instead of the or in combination with the consumption behavior. Oh, 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 uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Um, so when we were talking about the discrete choice experiment, I, I should have mentioned that. That's a good point. Um, when you're asking questions within a discrete choice experiment, you have to consider the reasonability, the reasonableness of that question. So if I were, we know, for example, because addiction is so not rational, in quotes, um, we know that um, if I were to ask a smoker, OK, I'm going to increase the smoke, I'm going to increase the price from $10 to $11, how many cigarettes per day are you going to consume in that new pricing environment? We know that you can't trust that choice because it's asking about a situation they've never seen before. Yeah. Okay. But you can ask, if, if would you buy in this case? Because they see those types of questions all the time. So when you're asking, when you're, when you're conducting a discrete choice experiment, you have to ask questions that are in the realm of things that people have experienced before. Otherwise, they're making estimates on things that maybe they're not really good at estimating. Other questions for Kurt? So Kurt, maybe I'll ask. Um, oh great, this feels like my defense all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'll, I'll go gentle this time. Um, oh goodness. Uh, so um, you had a slide where you uh, you uh, contrasted um, endogenous and exogenous factors. Yeah. Right? Um, could you go back to that? Uh, it's on the screen now, it should be. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Um, there's another one where you said, like, uh, discrete choice, like cho yeah. choice yeah. over, yeah. Yeah. This one? Yeah, that, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you have sort of an endogenous part and an exogenous part. And you yeah. say purchasing is driven by this use of discrete choice experiments. And you say that's exogenous. Um, but I, I, I want to be clear uh, for participants here. While um, the discrete choice experiment um, uh, was uh, parameterized, um, it was sort of characterized exogenously, it was driven by certain, like in the model, which, um, which choice context you're in right now, yes. Um, yes. how many cigarettes you have in your larder, um, and, uh, and, and aspects of your, um, uh, of, of your other um, uh, potentially dynamics at home, those might shape your decisions, right? So purchasing oh, dis right. decisions, how that depends on like what you will, the probability with which you undertake certain decisions in, in certain precisely defined context is exogenously specified. But the occurrence of those contexts in the model is in fact endogenous. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So it, I mean, I, I, has, I was has, a little bit hesitant to put exogenous on this because uh, one of the pieces about when you traditionally think of endogenous or exogenous is is that you can't ask. Uh, sorry, my daughter is standing at the door. I'm at home, so um, she's she's enjoying herself. She just finished the bath and she's now naked standing at my door. She's two, so it's okay. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, it, the, the exogenous model here. Does because we're using the discrete choice, the state of the state of preference, we're allowed to ask counterfactual situations. So we can create a statistical model that's describing things that, you know, no person that we're looking at has specifically experienced, which allows us to put that in the model, and then the model can essentially the ABM can ask the DCE counterfactual situations and say what's happening. So there is a bit of an endogenous component to it. But I put it exogenous because it's a, a statistical model that still makes some pretty simplifying assumptions. Yeah, and, and I, I'd say that, again, given, given the occurrence of a certain situation, if you, if you specify yes. the different possible uh, situations, 
the relationship between that and the, the probability of making a given decision is fixed. It's, it's defined yes. by the statistical yes. model. Yes. However, the occurrence of those situations and factors like the number of cigarettes that you have at home, and maybe there's a set of others. I'd be interested if, if there's others that I'm missing. Those are, those are things which occur as part of the endogenous behavior of this dynamic model. And as yes. such, it is kind of wrapped into endogenous pathways within the model to a degree. It's in well, that's, that's correct, because we're putting, we're putting this framework, and this is what's unique about it, we're putting this framework within a dynamic model. Exactly. Yeah, and so that we need, whenever we're doing that, we need to be able to make sure that, so for example, uh, um, in this research experiment, I never, we never asked the participants, if you have 100 cigarettes, what are you going to purchase? That number was constrained to be something like less than 20, depending on the person who's asking the question. Because we thought it would be unrealistic to say, if you have like 10 cartons of cigarettes, are you gonna buy anything? Most people would say no. So we didn't wanna make that unrealistic to ask. Which means then, that when we put the VCE inside the AVM, we're, we have to make it so that the AVM is asking questions of the model that are similar to the questions we ask people. So we can never get the AVM to say, Okay, agent, you have 100 cigarettes. What are you going to buy? Right? Because that would be that would be kind of breaking the rules of this of this of this framework. Right. You have you have no information about what they they you have no realistic information about what decisions they'd make in that context. That's right. We can reasonably say that anything that the discrete choice experiment is predicting is is the, the assumptions are broken by the time we're asking about 100 cigarettes and their stuff. Right. Yeah. So so yeah. When when you when you put it, you know, sort of when you when you bring these two models together, you have to consider what what the what the contact point is like. Are you making are you are you posing realistic questions of the DCE? Right. And at yeah. the same time, this joined feature to a degree it it, it endogenizes um, to a degree it endogenizes mm -hmm. the the, um, uh, the you know the the decision making. In as much as it's occurring in a in a changing endogenously characterized environment that can be shaped by counterfactuals, um, yep. in the counterfactual okay. intervention context, and because you're using uh, stated preferences, you have some understanding of how they might decide things even in these alternative situations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. very good. Very good. I, I wanted to to bring that out a little bit for participants. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, a question uh, here. Yeah. Uh, this, yeah. Still, the, this this uh, uh, slides uh, the the purchasing behavior actually is some kind of variables such as the, your income, uh, pri price elasticity, of demand. Well, that's kind of saying generally in, for the personal decision making should be organized. Should, should be rich. Endogenized, you said. Yeah, yeah. So, like a real model of, pr of, of, of pricing, like a real, like a sort of endogenous, a full endogenous model of human purchasing behavior, would definitely need to include things like price, you know, uh, my education level, my income level, all that stuff. Um, but we, I mean, I guess for, for, for reasons of, of simplicity, we didn't try to build an endogenous purchasing model. But one, I mean, if you did build one, you'd have to include those things. Did I get your question? Yeah, because I think the, uh, generally uh, the reason why I mean, a lot of uh, countries charge high tax on the cigarette, that's, that's I mean, a long way. Uh, yeah, that's right. But, but one of the things we wanted to learn from this was how that's going to affect different populations differently. Right? So if I put a, if I, put a I don't know, I go from $10 to $11. For somebody who's making $100,000 a year, $150,000 a year, they're going to have a different response to then to, to somebody who's making less. Right, and it may be a response that leads to, as you said, carton shopping and use of cartons might then lead to easier availability of cigarettes, um, you know, at arbitrary times, which might actually perversely sometimes 
um, uh, support heavy smoking behavior or impossible. Yeah, behavior. yeah, and and it, I mean, there's all sorts of other things that are outside the scope of this model that it could encourage, which is like, you know, it, it reduces your uh, your your sort of food income, uh, the, the money you'd be spending on food. So now your quality of food goes down because you're buying cigarettes at more expensive prices because the addiction is so strong. And so, you know, broadly speaking, at the population level, we know increasing prices decreases purchasing, but um, there is evidence to suggest that the reduction in tobacco consumption over the last 30 or 40 years is leveling off, which means that there's a population within, there's a subpopulation within the overall population that might be very resistant to those prices. And so increasing further can lead to all sorts of unintended consequences like we just talked about, or maybe the growth of illegal sourcing of cigarettes. Right, so there's all sorts of things, there's all sorts of reasons that we would want to understand some population's response to not only price, but other things like distance. So what? Or discount. Yeah. Discount. Because if you have a discount, if I'm buying a pack of cigarettes that's five dollars, or a pack of cigarettes that's normally six dollars, but it's five dollars, it's gonna be a different response. And so yeah, and it, and so an overall price elasticity curve doesn't capture that. It That's doesn't have texture yeah. and, and, and you know, uh, it's a great example of it. So if I um, if I'm buying a pack of cigarettes at five dollars before my tax, right? Just a normal flat pack at five dollars, and then there's a tax, and that tax makes the makes the pack go up to six dollars. And so then what the tobacco company might do is raise the, the price to six fifty, right? And so I'm not paying even more, which is seems kind of factual, but now they can give coupons for 50 cents, right? So the person feels like they're getting a deal, and they're still paying more for cigarettes, so. And you're saying they could do that at the same time the tax comes in, and it kind of, yeah. it, it kind of gives the impression that, oh, the price went up because of uh, big government, and you know. Uh, That's right. These, these bureaucrats are trying to live in, and then, oh, the tax company's my friend, it's giving, Given these right. online coupons for me, and I can get a bargain, you know, on these these cigarettes, and, and you know, uh, stick it to those bureaucrats. Yeah. So these are all the types of decisions that are totally missed when you make the really simplifying rational actor assumptions. Which is the reason why, like, as as much as I, we we liked using VCE, you know, by itself, I wouldn't trust it. Mm. I, I would I would prefer to see it placed within something kind of. And endogenizing it, like here. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, questions. Further questions. Great questions, though. Thank you. Kurt, what do you see as the um, primary limitation? Like, if you had to mention one or two, sort of uh, primary, um, you know, if you had to warn yourself, you know, two years back or warn someone going down this route, what would, you, what would you say are the top one or two things? Because it seems that this is a very general net that can be used for a lot of types of human decision making with respect to health behaviors, or you know, risk behaviors, protective behaviors, what have you, in a principled way that uses, um, Kurt didn't talk about it, but those, remember those questionnaires he showed? Those can be kind of in a quasi automatic way, this kind of a turn the crank sort of method to come up with these sort of questions. I don't know, Kurt, I'm, I'm exaggerating how simple it is, but the point is there's well-defined ways of coming up with these exact matrices of what questions you ask to elicit the right information you need um, to, to estimate your DCE model and uh, there's ways of estimating, you know, the number of participants you might need for power, for power purposes in that model. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it seems it's a very general method that can be applied for many types of behavior. And you know, you can go and mesh these decision-making models with dynamic models that help endogenize them by putting them into a rich, changing context and of agents or heterogeneous and have different preferences and different, you know, particular circumstances at different times to be considered the model. What would you say there are, are the, the, the one or two top um, warnings you give to someone? Well, that's a really good question because, um, I mean, every 
On, on the one hand, I want to respond by saying any simulation model you build is a simplification. So you want to make sure that you're not getting ahead of yourself by trusting the model more than you should be. Um, and you get a lot of insight about how your model is behaving by doing your calibration and validation process to figure out how realistic it can be. Um, so, so that's like one response. But the other, the other side of things is if you look at like what, what we're trying, what we were trying to develop here was a method that is better than what we're using now. And so rather than aiming at a method that like, you know, really accurately reproduces human behavior, the goal is to come up, if you replace that with a goal that is to come up with something that's better than what we're doing now, maybe I don't need to share my screen for this, I'll just go back to this part. Um, if you're just trying to, sh to do something that's better than what you're doing now, then, then the bar is a lot lower. And so in this situation, like based on what I know about street choice experiment surveys, I would have a hard time trusting results from any DCE that um, you know that that sort of has a, a, sort of a price that's maybe a little bit not normal, or it's a population that wasn't studied. Like if you do the DCE survey and then five years later, its predictions aren't useful anymore because the population is different. So um, the the biggest the biggest reason why I would not do an ABM, like the, the sort of limitation, is the time it takes to build one and the expertise it takes to build one. So um, I would say that's probably the biggest limitation that's like specific to this project because the DCE gives you some insight now. So you know a, a, maybe the DCE was maybe a quarter of the work or less. So we do the DCE and then we can get some results right now. We can publish on it or we can get some information about it or something. But if you go through the time and effort of building an agent-based model, you now and and I think the assumptions we made of the agent-based model were pretty generalizable. Like um, that they would be. They would be the case for a population now, a population 10 years ago, and a population 20 years from now. And so then, if you just do a DCE survey, you know, once you get the model built, if you do a DCE survey on a different population, you can do the same fitting appro approach, um, and, then, and then you get new, uh, new insights and new results. So I think that once you kind of get this framework for an ABM, it's really valuable. But the two pieces I would say that are probably the most the biggest reasons why people wouldn't use this approach, one of them is the time it takes to build the model and the expertise it takes. And then the second thing is you saw that it took 30 compute days of time to come up with these conclusions. And so that's a lot of, that's a very, very heavy computation that you know, using a DC survey by itself, you don't need. Very helpful. Those are probably the two responses I would say to that. Very helpful, very helpful. Yeah. Okay, any final question for Kurt, recognizing that we're, we're uh, we've kept him longer than promised, and, and uh, you know, he is, uh, uh, he's, he's well into the evening now. Um, uh, so any, any final questions for Kurt? Okay, I'd like to, uh, to thank Kurt um, very much for appearing with us uh, and for presentation of this uh, fine work. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope that you have um, a, a, a brain frying week. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kurt. Take care there. Thanks. So, thank you, everyone, um, for uh, uh, 